Hello class, it's Joseph again. Nice to see you. It's week six. I'm going to make this very brief. This is for uh, chapter six in the Blackburn textbook that we've been working through. Mostly engaging reading, a kind of fun intro to uh, big topics in philosophy. And we finally get to what is one of the more professional topics, I'll call it, reasoning and formal logic as well as the problem of inductive inference and scientific reasoning. Chapter 6 is about, I don't know, 35 pages long. It's painful. This is by far the driest chapter. Let me just outline a few bits of formal logic up front that most of us probably find intuitive and maybe have already heard of. And then the question this week for the discussion board will bear on induction, which is different than deduction. Induction is probably what most of us in ordinary circumstances perform without realizing it. It's kind of an automatic uh, instinct. You base and, and predict future experiences on the present and that you imagine the future will be something still like the present because that's what you've experienced and that's all that you've experienced. You're performing a kind of inference or extrapolation from here to the future based on all you know which is here. So that's inference, and of course that's problematic, as you'll read about on the discussion, discussion board question. Uh, excuse me. When it comes to formal logic, that is a huge field in what's called analytic philosophy of the 20th century. It got really popular in the 1930s and forward. Uh, Gottlieb Frege is a German who's responsible for quite literally giving birth to something like formal logic and symbolic logic using arrows and little notations to create what is called in, in late modern philosophy just semantic, the semantics of formal logic, which can be quite complicated after a while. The first few weeks of doing it can be rather straightforward and, and intuitive and easy, and then it can get very complex uh, very quickly. But two of the most <clears throat> basic formal rules for reasoning uh, would be the following. First, the law of non-contradiction. You cannot be both blue and not blue. You cannot be both American and not American, and so forth. So two exact circumstances cannot be both positive and negative. Uh, at the same time. Uh, that seems rather obvious, although that law of non-contradiction, that binary logic of either or, has been broken down in part by modern uh, French philosophy in particular, the, what you call postmodern philosophy. Um, the, the other rule that seems to be employed as a tool often would be the if-then rule. If Q, then P. And it works in this way. It doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean the content is reasonable. It just means that the formal structure is plausible. It's like an algorithm. It always works this way. If all men are hairy and Jack is a man, then therefore Jack is hairy. If, then. And now, of course, not all men are hairy. Uh, whatever we mean by that, if we mean covered fully in hair or maybe got really hairy beards or something like that. Uh, and so maybe Jack is not fully a man given, given gender issues today. But the point is, the content doesn't matter about hairy and gender. It's just it's the formal structure, the if-then. If all animals scream when they see me and there is an animal before me, therefore it will scream. Of course, not all animals scream. Not all animals can scream, so on and so forth. So you get the point that formal logic can be used as a tool to eliminate what Blackburn calls the scope of ambiguity. We begin to apply formal logic rigorously. Sometimes it can be a little bit absurd and annoying because life is full of ambiguity, and that's okay to be comfortable with ambiguity. But sometimes ambiguity can be an obstacle, it can be harmful, it can be muddying the waters unnecessarily. 
So reasoning just means, I think in this chapter, right? Reasoning means a way of inhabiting the world that questions and interrogates one's assumptions about the world and one's assumptions about one's speech. Am I actually meaning what I say? Am I thinking and delib am I deliberate about every word I use? Uh, reasoning as well for the scientific worldview towards the end of the chapter is often rooted in not a priori laws, but experience and experience only and the data that is given. And science, of course, is always evolving and changing. And the timeless laws that science creates 10 or 20 years later are seen to be not so timeless and need to, need to be revised uh, because experience and our understanding of the texture of experience changes and our tools to analyze experience uh, become more refined or just different, maybe not more refined, just different. So the chapter on reasoning is not an easy chapter there are some good bits. I've picked those out. An induction, the chap, the section on induction, the seven or eight pa pages, I would read that carefully, and I'd read the last five or six pages as well. Uh, the beginning on formal uh, notations, you can read and skim some of that, uh, and some of that can be hard to read. So enjoy this week. Enjoy the discussion board. You can talk about induction, whether we can extrapolate or how careful we should be when we extrapolate from circumstances to therefore predict every other circumstance. Uh, have a great week.